Hello, this is Ann Jones, Webcast Manager at Premia, and I am pleased to welcome you to this Premia webinar. Today, Dr. Ariane Chappelle will present Defining, Influencing, and Measuring Risk Culture. Ariane is a professional trainer and independent advisor with 20 years of experience in teaching and training both academic and executive audiences. She is active in operational risk since 2000 with business experience in internal audit and risk management managerial functions. Ariane acquired these skills in ING Group and Lloyd Banking, academic research, independent consulting, and training. She has designed, managed, and run operational risk training programs for several international banks. She facilitated hundreds of training sessions and operational risk across Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Ariane is tenured associate professor of finance and risk management from the University of Brussels, Belgium. She has published books and articles on corporate governance and operational risk modeling and management. She won two years in a row the Outstanding Speaker Award in the MBA program of Warwick University. She is a full member of the Institute of Risk Management and the Institute of Operational Risk. Please feel free to submit your questions to the presenter via the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during the presentation. Audience questions will be moderated by Premium's Education Director, Alex Voiku, and answered by on Ariane at the end of the session as time allows. So now, Ariane, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. I'm very excited to uh, have the opportunity to run this webinar with you. So today, we'll talk about definition, um, influence, of, influence of risk culture, and the measurement of risk culture. And I'm trying to move my slides. There you go. Um, just before we start, um, a little quick poll question for you. Is your institution currently looking to change or to improve its risk culture? Just quickly respond, yes or no. I have launched the poll question. You have 10 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll question. I will share your results now. We had 71% said yes and 9% or 29% said no. Okay, very good. Um, I will have more questions for you. So 70% roughly trying to change or in, um, planning to change the risk culture. Very good. That's, that's going to be our, our topic of today. Now, one definition of risk culture is culture is what happens when no one is looking. So that's, um, that's a definition I like uh, because it's, it, says, it says a lot. Uh, risk culture is what's in your gene, uh, what you do because what you believe in, it relates to your value. So we're going to talk about values, motivation, influence, and influence of, of, of these motivation. So the content of today will be the definition of risk culture or the definition of what you want, the definition of the target risk culture. And before defining your target risk culture, we will uh, reflect on the purpose of operational risk. You're doing operational risk. Many of you um, among the audience are risk managers in operational risk or other risks. What is it? Then we're going to talk about the three levels of risk management, the ORM pyramid, and that will give me the opportunity to, to introduce this, um, uh, this structure of operational risk management uh, to the techniques and uh, the upcoming course uh, with Premia. And then I will ask you a poll, poll question about your, uh, your key objective of operational risk and the definition of vital behavior, which is exactly what uh, you want people to do to behave when no one is looking precisely. Then I will take you through the, um, the literature and research on influencing methodology and the tweaks uh, I've done to this model to come up with the desire model. Now, to be honest with you, I've worked a little bit on the acronym of this. Initially, it was MESAR, but MESAR is not very sexy. Desire is a lot, it works a lot better, and it, it says the right thing, I believe. And finally, we'll talk about some, some instruments or some elements on how to measure uh, risk culture. And of course, we'll save some time for questions. So I'll finish speaking in about 45 minutes, so you'll have plenty of time uh, to answer the questions. So the first, first section, uh, what are the objectives of risk management, and how can you define a target risk culture? 
So the first question is a simple question, but I've been very, uh, very surprised to notice that a number of uh, directors in risk management sometimes struggle to answer this question. What do we want to achieve exactly? What is the purpose of risk management in our, in our organization and why? And then guess what? That's a poor question for you. So my question is, what would you best describe as the main purpose of risk management in your institution? I have some proposals, and we can later on during the question discuss more options. A, avoidance of catastrophic losses. B, regulatory compliance. C, reduction of capital charge. D, increase in earning stability. And um, E, increase in the growth of business. I have launched the poll question. You have approximately 10 to 20 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll question. I will show your results now. 30% said A, 20% said B, 10% said C, 20% said D, and 20% said E. Sorry, Anne, can you re repeat that, please? Yes, I had 30% said A, 20% said B, 10% said C, 20% said D, and 20% said E. Okay, oh, that's a good surprise. <laughs> uh, good surprise for the E thing. Um, and everybody, everybody answered. That's wonderful. I hope. Um, very good. So you um, you've answered that question, and and these are these are some some proposals for you. And why am I uh, happily surprised? Is because for for E was E was actually my hope, and I was expecting um, a much less than twenty percent. Um, a way of looking at constructive risk management, operational risk being just one aspect of risk management, is to accelerate the business. Um, accelerate by opposition to the analogy of risk management with brakes. Usually you ask why people, why cars have brakes, why cars have brakes to slow down, but having brakes allow you to go faster. So it's only because you are confident in the soundness of your risk management, whether it's credit risk, market risk, compliance risk, operational risk, IT risk, that you can be confident that your business can grow and grow in a safe way. And alongside that, uh, a core importance of risk management and a core way to sell risk management, because that's what we're talking about here uh, today, is about risk culture, about empowering risk management in organization, is to position risk management as a business facilitator and for being a business facilitator it needs to be aligned with business priorities. And business priorities can, in, in, it can ab be absolutely specific to any organization. So some examples are protect reputation. Now of course no company will tell you that they want to destroy their reputation but some companies are particularly sensitive of how they're perceived and, and that's a brand name. It can be enhanced franchise value and be uh, exploiting some sort of competitive advantage. It can be customer service. It can be a zero loss or more efficiency or more processes or more innovation. It can be, you know, the sky is the limit in terms of ima imagination. And by aligning risk management priorities to business priorities, that's when you become an enabler. So that relates to your, uh, essentially, to your E answer. Now, Drilling down to operation and risk more specifically, I'm totally with you that, and that's why it, it's one of my first bullet, bullet points, is that avoiding, the, avoiding catastrophic losses is probably the number one, uh, the number one objective of operation and risk management is not enterprise risk management in organization. No one wants to trip over and fail. And then the other classic ones are uh, reducing capital charge, re reducing economic capital, regulatory capital, um, get the regulator of your of your back and 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 be compliant, and then uh, reducing uh, expected loss. And then the best way in terms of efficiency is to improve performance by by lean processes. Now. Relating to that, uh, the structure of operation risk management can be sliced into three levels. At strategic levels, 
and that's linked to the risk appetite definition, the choice of portfolio activities, the strategic view of what it is exactly that we want to achieve, like we discussed. Then the technical levels are um, the, all the tools and techniques that you put in place to reduce your losses and also to avoid um, this catastrophic loss and, um, and di uh, diminish the volatility of your business. And finally, the dynamic part is these lean processes, uh, focusing on optimization and operational efficiency. So that's just to, to set the context. Um, why am I setting the context? Because the risk culture is basically underpinning all risk management actions. And if you and make them making them more effective and maybe more efficient, but definitely more effective. If you slice these risk management actions in terms of operational risk, especially. You, you can read this pyramid from bottom to top. So you start with loss database and loss reporting. Then you set up your operational risk governance and your risk correspondence. You move on with um, risk and control self-assessment. Then if you're more elaborated, you're on scenario analysis, operational risk modeling. If you're an advanced approach, then you have key risk indicators and operational risk appetite. But only that can operate and be um, effective if you have a supportive risk culture. So, so the structure of this pyramid um, is actually uh, replicated into a three-day training that Premier um, will organize in Q4 this year, um, which, I, um, uh, which I designed with a split of three days alongside this, um, this operational risk management pyramid. So on the first day, we will um, talk about the regulation, of course, and the compliance constraints, the regulatory constraints of operational risk management, how the different frameworks are organized from the COSO to ISO to IRM uh, banking framework, or insurance framework, loss database analysis and reporting, the governance, and the risk and control self-assessment. So the first, first half of the matrix, if you want, of the pyramid. Second day will be um, dedicated to tools and techniques um, inspired from the, um, the Institute of Risk Management, which is um, a lot more cross-sector uh, than some other uh, financial uh, association network using uh, brainstorming tools on risk identification, bow tie tools on risk root cause analysis, very effective tools. We're going to talk a lot about key risk indicators, which is a, a topic of research for me for over a year. Human error and control design, also in, uh, inspired by the work of James Reason in um, healthcare and patient safety. And then this, the third day will be on scenario analysis, risk appetite, risk culture, and then some issues uh, on operation and risk modeling. So that's just um, just a quick uh, presentation of this of this course. Now, why is risk culture important? Clearly, uh, because it makes risk management worthwhile. So now what you, you, um, that you have defined your, your objectives, we can talk about influencing the risk culture. So if your objectives, for instance, based on your response are avoiding catastrophic, uh, catastrophic loss or growing the business, how are you going to influence people's behavior to achieve these core objectives? Now, the methodology I will review with you today is um, vastly inspired from a book that you may have, have read uh, called Influenza, The Power to Change Anything, from four authors, Patterson, Gretti, Maxfield, and Macmillan, five, sorry, in Switzerland, who are the same author who, were, who wrote Crucial Conversation. Now, their statement is that people behave, there are two necessary conditions for people to behave, willingness and ability. You need to be willing to ride a bike, to ride a bike, but you also need to be able to ride a bike. If you're unwilling to ride, you won't ride, but if you're unable to ride, you may be willing, you won't be. And that addresses the classic hurdle that you observe in people's management in organization. You can motivate people to do things, but if they can't do it, and especially if they don't admit they can't do it, you won't achieve anything. And in terms of motivation, so working on the, the willingness, you have three levels of incentive. You have personal incentive. I do it because I like to do it. I go to the gym because I like going to the gym and running on the treadmill. Social, I do it because others do it. 
I have to have a Facebook account because everybody has a Facebook account. Yeah, you can guess I have a teenage daughter. Um, or I go to the gym because everybody around me goes to the gym. And then structural, because I measure like this. I go into the gym because I'm a, I'm a model and I need to look good. I sell insurance policies because I'm incentivized on volumes. And clearly, historically, it's over demonstrated that organizations typically stress the structural levels. So we tend to influence people's behavior, especially in the financial services. Um, we tend to influence people's behavior by the way we pay them. But there's a lot more than pay to uh, people's behavior. And going, on, finishing on this influencer matrix before moving on to the adaptation of this to a uh, risk management uh, environment, you have the crossing of motivation and ability at each level of incentive, personal, social, structural. So at personal and motivational level, you will work on the overcome reluctance and resistance, connecting to values, so trying to inspire, and we'll put, that will be my I in my desire model, inspire people about uh, what they need to do, inspire them to risk management, basically, if you convert that to risk culture. Working on ability at individual level is working on training, but active training. So learning by doing, I'll, I'll come to that in more details in, in the upcoming slides. Social motivation relates both to uh, levering on influencer in organizations, on people who will act as role models, and find strength in number is using the power of the groups and making people working together make teamwork unavoidable, basically. Structural, actually there's one cell, this cell here, um, that is um, uh, well understood in organizations, so rewards and accountability. So these are the classic KPI, but possibly more. Something that is under, uh, underestimated in organization is to change the environment. How can you change the environment to support risk management, basically, and we're going to talk about propinquity. So I took this matrix, and initially I found this book, The Little Stories, that an associate gave me this book. I read it. I found it wonderful. I sent it to my friend at the FSA, so the UK regulator, and he wrote back to me, this is a fascinating book, but how do I do? How do I encourage people to change their risk culture? Because that's a, a, a discussion I have regularly with the regulator. How do I make sure that people have a good risk culture, and how do I influence this risk culture? So I broke that into a number of practical steps that I would like to share with you uh, today. I'll be more interested in having your feedback at the end of this session. So the first D of my desire model is defined, basically. So we're back to IID of the global um, objective of risk management. You need to influence people, but influence in what sense? So before you leverage a change, before you decide to deploy your risk culture, and for the 70% of you who are listening and decide to change the risk culture, the number one step is really to define your objective, what it is exactly what you want to achieve, and more specifically, how do you want people to behave? Because you can say, well, we want people to be more risk aware. Well, what does it mean really to be risk aware? What it is exactly that you want to define in terms of behavior? So there we are. Uh, the third poll question for you, but I'll give you some more hints later. I just want to have your views on that. So what would be the vital behavior, so the key behavior that you would like to generalize the most in your institution? There again, for proposal, the reporting of events, so we want people to report your losses, swift escalation of potential issues, transparent information on risk exposure, or risk management knowledge? I have launched the poll question. You have approximately 10 to 20 seconds to answer. I have closed the poll question. I will share your results now. We had 0% said A, 24% said B, 29% said C, and 48% said D. Uh, that's 
very good. That's absolutely that's that's approximately the opposite of what um, I was expecting. Um, but that's um, that, that that's very good. Actually, I've I've run these questions a lot in um, in live training, and the number one objective I have from risk manager I talk to is to get people to report losses, which none of you have ticked. Most of you have ticked risk management knowledge, um, which will be interesting because the challenge I have for you is how do you translate risk management knowledge into uh, into behavior. For C and B it's easier because actually C and B um, are descriptions of behavior itself, transparent information or reporting on transform, transparent information on risk exposure and risk escalation. So how, how do you identify vital behavior? So if, you're, if your top um, objective is, is um, risk management knowledge, how would, what is the behavior that will translate risk management knowledge and how you can measure it, where you can test it? So, uh, so I, I guess that's, that's feasible. A way to identify uh, vital behavior is to observe what the others are doing differently uh, than, uh, than others in terms of performance. So if you have departments with less losses, better processes, no catastrophic losses going back to your initial, uh, initial objective, um, better customer satisfactions, better performance, uh, better escalation, uh, better uh, type of reporting, what it is they're doing in terms of teamwork, in terms of um, uh, sharing of information, in terms of reporting and collections that the others are not doing. Consult previous research, and there, are, there is some literature, not much I must say, on, uh, on risk culture. Uh, with the attitude and the, the core of uh, literature on risk culture is the attitude of management. So observing the attitude of management with regards to uh, the support to risk function, but with also no, a no blame culture. So how destroying is a blame culture, for instance? What's the reaction of um, uh, what the reaction of risk uh, management or risk management when you report losses? Um, another uh, avenue for uh, researching and identifying vital behavior is investigate repetitive hurdles. By that, I mean when you have constant types of losses or constant types of information that is either not reported or not assessed, what is it? Where is the core pattern? And it's not it's it's uh, beyond the scope of this uh, of this webinar today. But for that, the bow tie analysis, so the root the type of root cause analysis of events is very, very helpful to really go back to the initial reasons of why things are happening. Examples of key attitudes that enable good management is transparency on incidents, transparency on weaknesses and vulnerabilities, uh, and, and that's one of the things that you mentioned. Swift escalation is uh, well known as uh, one of the core attitudes to uh, have better risk management and especially better incidence management and to reduce the impact of an incident because you can act um, early. Risk awareness and risk knowledge translated how? Um, translated in action basically and we'll back into the, the idea of measuring that. Uh, risk knowledge will be enabled by training and will measured by uh, risk proficiency, and, and that will be the, the other session, the other sections of this of this webinar. So, how do you influence these vital behavior? Let's take, take swift escalation, for instance. Well, if you want people to escalate their loss, or if you want people to be transparent about their weaknesses, transparent about their needs, um, or simply being positive about risk management, that can be an attitude and a behavior that would like you'd like to reinforce. So for that, you need to inspire. And you note know that uh, the second letter of desire is a need, E, not an I. That's because you have, I have to mingle my acronym a little bit so it works. But I wanted to catch your, um, your attention. So by inspire, you need to communicate a vision. So first of all, that's why you have the definition. What's your vision? What's your, 
long-term objectives for risk management. And you empower this vision by telling stories. You need a Chinese say that the picture tells a thousand words. Well, it's a story tells a, is a lot more powerful than statistics. So you tell negative stories first to raise awareness. Using these influencer methodology, uh, there was this project in the US called 100,000 Lies. And 100,000 Lies was aimed at reducing this avoidable death because 100,000 was the number of deaths in the healthcare sector in the US in hospitals due to avoidable mistakes. If I tell you 100,000 deaths due to avoidable mistakes, you'll say, oh, that's a lot, that's sad. If I tell you the story of Josie King, who dies, a little girl who died at the age of 18 months, I probably won't finish my story because I'll cry and I'll, just, I'll depress all of you. That's how powerful a story is. Now, I don't, I'm not asking you to be as dramatic in risk management, but that's the general idea. If you start your risk management selling point by telling statistics about losses, people will go, yeah, 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 yeah. If you go with specific stories of large losses, large reputation impacts, of bad threats, something that happened in your group or in a neighbor company that really impedes the business, that will be, um, that will be a, lot, um, a lot more powerful, including the uh, individual fines, jail sentences, etc. Now, you don't want to depress everybody all the time, of course, so you need to raise morale and you need to provide solution encouragement. So then, now that you, you describe what's at stake, um, you can describe what the positive story is. And I've, I've started actually this webinar with the positive positioning and with a lot of you having raised already with your 20% core objective as being an accelerator to the business or growing businesses, risk management is here to facilitate the business. There's another element is uh, risk management, whether operational risk or other risk management, is a competitive advantage. I was in a large international bank earlier this week and, uh, and preparing the, um, the seminar uh, with one of the senior executives. I was telling, them, uh, telling him how good I think he is because I thought it's an excellent bank and he says, yes, but we're good at it because we've invested a lot and we're doing this for a long time. And that's a barrier to entry to our competitor. And he's absolutely right. Good risk management does provide competitive advantage. But another very, very important element in risk management, especially in operational risk, which is a relatively new discipline by new, I mean 10 years old, is that we're good already, or you're good already. A lot of people do a lot of risk management without even calling it risk management. If you think of your private life, you do risk management all the time. You take your bag with you, you, walk, you watch your kids, you watch when you cross the street. Now, when I talk to risk manager, it's natural. But to people in the business, a lot of the time they don't realize they do risk management day in, day out. And finally, and especially when you talk to overstretched organization, and one of my um, uh, loyal or, or intense clients is an American company who's very, very stretched on resources, their, their number one, ben, the number one benefit they see in risk management is having more time, is working smarter, is improving your control and your prevention so that you're not in firefighting all the time and eventually you save time. So there's a, there are a lot of positive messages that you can deliver to uh, about risk management. And by telling stories uh, and telling the vision, it nurtures our basic need, and what I mean are, I mean human beings, which is the sense of belonging and the sense of purpose. The, the, the view of we're all in this together and we all need a purpose of doing things is an absolutely powerful um, uh, powerful uh, sentiment. And then finally, you can have difficult things or, or, or annoying things to ask. So consultation is of, course, uh, in, is, of course, the key. And the example here between parentheses is lost database. It's, uh, it can be very daunting. Uh, it annoys everybody. So asking people on the best way to you know, develop their knowledge in risk management, if that's your, your core uh, ID, or report losses or escalate, make their lives easier. Now, once you've raised the motivation, once you've defined your vision, you've raised the motivation by the inspirational talks and everything, you need to work on enabling people on the training aspect. 
Uh, because otherwise, it just leads to frustration. Now, if people want to all know about risk and be a good risk manager, you have to give them the tool to be risk, to be a good at managing risk. And that's also a core role of risk management, being second line of defense. You want your risk managers to help the business to be a methodological support and a help in, in, uh, in, in what they can do in their business. And then you have um, a lot of classic um, good practices, let's say, in, in teaching. So apply active learning. So you need to have to keep your audience active, uh, to work on the learning by doing. It's not by preaching them that they can actually do something. If we had a, a training session rather than a webinar, although I love this webinar, but uh, in a course here, what I would like I ask you to do is after defining your, your, your vision and after we can throw the slides, and actually that's what I encourage you to do if, if that's your objective while you attend the webinar, is after, take back the slides and draft your own action plan. Now, when you teach, you have to, and when, or when you learn, you have to know your type. You may know whether or not you're visual or auditive or even kinesthetic. So kinesthetic, you need, there are people who need to move and need to be shocked by image. So basically, visual people are like people who like to read a, a content in order to memorize it. Auditive ones are the ones who need to hear it to memorize it. Kinesthetic need to be, have images and, and feel it and do it, really. So when you train people, when you train your audiences, for instance, to um, uh, spread risk management knowledge, if, if, that's your, uh, if that's your core objective, you need to address all these audiences. So you need auditive content, visual context, images, different delivery, exercise, teamwork, all, that, all sorts of things. And this essential element of training and of instruction is being specific. Being specific is telling people what to do rather than the ultimate goal. So on the uh, on the personal diet level, is snack on carrots, drink water, and run 30 minutes a day, rather than you should lose weight. On the risk management issue, rather than be aware of your risk, is let's say make a list, um, identify your your top risk. How do you identify your top risk? Once you have your you identify your top risk, you escalate if there's an issue. You talk to your boss if there's a, if there's a a doubt, um, if you're not sure, if we talk about compliance, if you're not sure that you haven't uh, checked a, com a customer uh, one way or another, you look at this checklist or you take, so very concrete instructions rather than the, the, general, the general goals. And um, break global objectives into stepping stones that people can achieve, leveraging on teamwork is also very useful and this sort of mentoring a mentoring stu structure correct quickly and praise often it's true for risk management it's, it's true for every learning there are studies that have been run in primary schools where they shown that the differentiation between the best teacher and the worst teacher uh, were the praise and the correction so the best teacher when assisting kids in learning how to read, they were correcting their word as they were reading and encouraging them. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't relate the the rewards to the actions or the the punishment to the actions, you completely lose the link, and people don't make the link. Now, it seems completely obvious when we talked about people, uh, about students, primary students learning how to read and write, but when you look at organizations and how. Uh, the rewards are organized. You get your bonus if you get a, if you're lucky enough to get a bonus, or even the end of year appraisal that takes place in January or February, even in March of the following year, and that relates to your action in January, February, March, etc. On the year before, so you have this disconnect, and people don't make don't make the link. Now, you have the. The, the training, and then how do you support it? Because if you do the training only, you bear the risk that people will write on their notebook and then forget about it. So you need a constant supportive environment, supporting on the human level and supportive at physical level. So at human level, it relates to the notion of natural opinion leaders that will act as role model. So what is a natural leader? What is an influencer? It is typically people who are recognized for their expertise on the topic and for the empathy. So they're both clever and 
subject matter experts on what they are working on, but they're also nice to people and they like to share their knowledge, so they're respected. And a way to identify these natural leaders, the way to identify these influencers, for instance, is to run a poll in businesses. Who do you, you know, admire the most? Who do you recognize as an expert? Who would you go to for advice? If you have to escalate or if you want an advice on risk management or if you want an advice on a way to do business, where would you look at? Where do you look at? Who do you look up to, for instance? These are all examples of questions. You run this sort of anonymous poll, the responses are anonymous, the names mentioned of course are not, um, and the recurrent names will be your influencers. And these are the guys that you need to convince first if you need to leverage, if you need a change in, in your corporate culture. And you can formalize that by mentoring programs. They will be the official mentors for risk management knowledge, for escalation, for positive attitude to risk management, to um, whatever your, your vital behaviors are. That's one aspect. The physical aspect is being helped by the way you designed your environment to fit your purpose, to fit your me message. And there's a field of um, research in psychology, which is very interesting to that matter, it's propinquity, and in the business environment, it's called occupational propinquity. Now, propinquity is the link between the, propinquity means nearness in Latin, meaning the link between the closer you are to a topic, the more positive attitude you develop towards this topic. Because you feel, it feels more familiar, it feels more comfortable, there you start liking it. The equivalent, the romantic Hollywood equivalent is a man and a woman are stranded on, a ha on an island, they hate each other at first, and at the end of the movie they get married. Well, it has a, fi a, a, a psychological background in, in research in, in the matter of propinquity. Now, going back to the risk management issue, you would typically want to put physically next to each other departments who need to collaborate but possibly don't like each other at first. In a market environment, in a trading environment, a classic example is in front office and back office. Now, in the, in the old days, I mean 10, 20 years, 15 years ago in, in banks, most, most, more often than not, back offices were, uh, of, of trading activities, I mean, were on the same floor front office. They were meeting at the coffee machine. Uh, they were knowing each other, and even though they were doing different business, they knew more or less what was going on, and they knew each other personally. Now, the outsourcing and the relocation to overseas or, or to some other remote location has broke down this link to a, a number of investment banks. And I was talking to an international investment bank recently about um, a training on risk culture, and I was mentioning this topic, and uh, the, the HR lady confirmed to me that for the sites for which they had the back office and the front office in the same building, the relationship and the level of losses as well were significantly different than from the, uh, for the other locations when they had it in different buildings and sometimes in different countries. Um, but you can replicate that to other departments. If you're in a credit card business, you typically want your fraud department to be in close contact with your IT department because fraud use IT a lot. Uh, but if marketing hates risk management or hates compliance because marketing wants to, and that's not specific to the credit card business, can be any sort of business, marketing wants to communicate, they want to say all sorts of things, and um, a compliance department is freaking out every time because they have to check the message, the legal content, etc. You need these people to collaborate a lot closely, and just by a physical change in the environment, you help without having to organize meetings or, or to do anything uh, strict about it. So once you have your definition, your enabling, your vision, and the training, your support, you have the reinforcement. And re reinforcement is basically rewarding the good behavior and punishing the, the bad behavior. So praise is called positive reinforcement, and, and sanctions is negative reinforcement. Now, if you have kids at school, or if you have, you have kids at all, you know that constant praise uh, Positive praise needs to be frequent to be, um, to be effective, uh, but when they are effective, they're a lot more effective than negative reinforcement. 
But that they need to be frequent and they also need to be directly linked to actions and specific. So someone does something well, um, react positively. Now, more generally, if you don't want to praise your staff all the time, which I totally um, I can understand, it's also how you, risk manager, react to the business when the business does something. If you want swift, swift escalation of issues, or if you want loss reporting, when a business reports a loss, the way you react will be crucial in the upcoming reporting. So the way to react needs to be, of course, constructive and helping. I was discussing in a commercial bank recently, and the IT department was clearly saying to the risk manager, if I, re if I report a loss, I have no value except reporting my losses because you do nothing, you're not helping me, and it's up to me to solve the problem. If you are sending teams resources to help me fix the problem, make sure it doesn't happen, I'll be more than happy to report the losses. And what I observe is a threshold to report losses in a number of organizations is because they fear of blame, they fear of having to fix the problems themselves, they don't see the value of what risk management can help. So I really encourage the risk management function to be a, a methodological support, a sort of internal consulting support, rather than an oversight type of, we're going to check if you're doing things well. No, 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 we help you to do things well. So that's part of, importantly, the positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is, is, about, uh, is about punishment, but like every punishment, it needs to be credible and needs to be predictable. If you say, well, we're going to sting you with audit if you don't report your losses, or, you, or you're going to have a capital charge, an internal capital allocation charge, if, if that's how your organization works, if you don't report your losses, it has to be uh, it has to be done, otherwise you lose your credibility. And sanctions need to be predictable, meaning there's a rule, these are the rules, these are the sanctions if you breach the rules. Now, there's always need to room for error, so you, you're allowed to breach the, room, the, the, the rule once if you didn't know, but not repetitively. Now, in terms of reinforcement, um, it, you can have different negative or positive reinforcement, especially positive reinforcement, if you know what drives people. Now, the, the classic, uh, the classic positive reinf uh, the classic reinforcement in, in organizations are key performance indicators. So the way you pay people basically drives their behavior, and there's you know very little way out of it. And actually, um, we had a meeting with the Institute of Operational Risk recently uh, in London, and uh, highlighting the top risk, top operational risk for 2013, and the misalignment of incentives to risk management objective was considered for us as not only the top 10, but it, it was in the top three of operational risk that we see. So, going back to our the structure of our, our, our webinar here, you want objectives of the company, objectives of risk management, and you need to align the objective of people. There's, there's no need to, you know, trying to reinforce risk management if people are incentivized based on profit and no, no, no sort of, of, uh, of risk-based performance. Um, but there's also non-financial uh, non drivers like pride, recognition, sense of purpose. Uh, for those of you who have studied the rogue trading incidents, rogue, trading, rogue traders were never motivated by money. They were motivated most of the times by, um, by the need for recognition and pride. Um, compliments or non-financial rewards in a number of sectors have proven to be, uh, proven to be effective. And then finally, I'm on the E of my uh, DESIRE acronym. How do you measure that? Well, you measure the change based on your initial objective. So that's also, uh, it, it's, in, it, it's important to, uh, to define your, your objectives. And you can see the percentage change in, uh, after different periods, three months, six months, nine months, have people um, improved in their behavior, have improved in their knowledge, if there's a risk management knowledge, if it's a technical knowledge on a, on a credit risk or a market risk, you tested before your program, you test it after, you run online testing, for instance, that's quite easy to organize. If you fail on some elements, if there are resistance, maybe something wrong with your plan, so you need to reassess and correct because there's, it's unlikely that you get everything right in the first time. 
unless you're very, very skilled or very, very lucky or both. And then you can measure the classic uh, impact on risk management, which is in terms of quantitative data, the number of events, the number of fines, the number of uh, losses, the measure of productivity, uh, and ad additional measure linked to your initial goals. So you can measure customer satisfaction. Uh, you, can, you can measure brand recognitions and surveys. The idea is to align these measurements, of course, to your uh, initial objectives. So we're now in the last uh, section of risk culture. I talked about measurement already um, in, the, in my evaluating part, uh, but that's, uh, that's the global feature of measurement and another, uh, another reference for you because I'm an absolute book freak. And uh, every time uh, there's a topic I like, I, um, I buy a book and I, and I read it. So I have tons and tons of books, no, no, almost tons, on risk management. One that I like is the one from Douglas Hubbard. He, he's written a lot of interesting things. And uh, he's on, that's the second edition. He's preparing the third one now. It's called How to Measure Anything, uh, Measuring the Intangible in Businesses. So. Um, a few features on, on measurement. Measure your, your success against objectives. So that reinforces the importance of defining your objectives first. Uh, so for instance, if, if it's loss reporting that you behavior around loss reporting, you can um, measure before and after the completeness of your database, the speed of reporting, the difference between events reported, the time difference between event reported and events uh, uh, discovered. Escalation of serious events, speed of escalation, number of large losses aborted. Um, of course, you cannot you cannot know what you've avoided, but you can measure the the speed of management of large events. When you have a large event um, striking, what's the speed of re reaction, and how much mitigation can you put in place uh, to avoid large losses? Different scores of customer satisfaction or reputation. And in measurement, it's all about uncertainty red reduction. So you start with something completely uncertain, like what's the level of knowledge of my staff with risk management? How do I reduce this uncertainty? Well, by asking a few online four questions, basic questions of all your staff, and, um, and, and, and getting a sense of where they're, they're at already reduces a lot of uncertainty. So the bigger your uncertainty, basically, the less data you need, provided it's relevant information to already reduce this uncertainty. So a few uh, specific examples in terms of risk culture. You have um, the more general picture of tone from the top. So what's the senior management communicating and behaving in terms of support to the risk management function? Do you have a CRO on the board? What's your CRO centrality? Now, CRO centrality actually comes from a metric published in Journal of Finance. It's amazing to see that even Journal of Finance nowadays publishes on risk culture. Uh, and the authors define the ratio between the CRO pay and the CEO pay as the CRO centrality. So basically, the closer this ratio to one, so basically the highest the pay of CRO, the better it, it is a proxy of a support of the corporate uh, top management to the risk management, and actually, it is positively correlated to resilience, and resilience being measured as the the, the resilience of these um, financial companies during the crisis. Composition of the risk committee: who sits there? Uh, what's the calendar of the meetings? Do you have minutes of the meetings? Um, what what the in in these meetings? What's the list of actions and the the um, the outstanding actions? Now, in terms of outstanding actions, we touch upon this, the, the, the topic of discipline. Um, and discipline translates into basically overdues and deadlines. So it's a, it's a known uh, metric that outstanding uh, audit recommendation, especially outstanding high risk audit recommendation, is a flag. Um, and it's also a signal of how audit how internal audit is taken seriously or not in organization. And I'm telling you for knowing some bad examples, you don't want to work in an organization that doesn't take audit or risk management seriously, for that matter. So you don't want long deadlines. You don't want to overdue. You don't want to overdue on your action plans. 
and then uh, all the metrics around uh, lost data and, uh, and comprehensiveness of, of lost data. Then you have the metrics around the behavior, that's the, around the vital behavior we, you, uh, you discussed, and the metrics around staff competency, and that uh, immediately relates to your top objectives about, um, about risk management knowledge. Uh, that's the number of errors due to mistakes, so doing due to uh, insufficient knowledge rather than slips, being due to inattention. That's what James Reason, uh, another of my core book, James, James Reason, Human Error, what he calls strong but wrong. So you're doing something intentionally but wrongly because, because you, ha you don't have the, the right set of knowledge. And then all, all sorts of scores on quality uh, service or, or customer focus. And 50 minutes, that's it, that's it for me. I'm more than happy to listen to your questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Ariane, for taking us through the desire framework, which actually makes me think of the um, new framework from the CFTC uh, mantra, uh, or sorry, new, new line from the CFTC mantra, which, where they say, all we need to do is keep, keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's uh, what's the um, what's the role of remuneration uh, in risk culture? That's your question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, huge, unfortunately. Um, uh, it's it's huge in it's huge in driving behavior. Uh, it's not so huge in driving risk culture. Um, but it is useful. I have t two, two examples on that. Um, one example is in Rayrock. I used to work in credit risk. And, um, and years ago, when, when with my, uh, my institution, we wanted to implement Rayrock, which is not a, a straightforward measure of risk-adjusted risk return on capital, but for credit risk, people were listening politely. And then all of a sudden, we decided to put rare rock objectives in the performance objectives of the of the credit risk sales force and I, I was in the head office and with two of us and this, our phone didn't stop ringing so it definitely definitely drives the tension and it can be a preliminary to risk culture so it's risk behavior it's not culture yet if you go back to the initial definition culture is what happens no one, when no one's looking in that instance someone is looking because someone's measuring you now, what do you do when you're not measured? Do you, do, do, you, do you expose the bank for credit risk or not, regardless of your risk-based measure? And, and that's, that's risk culture. Uh, so risk culture is more about shared values rather than enforced behavior. Now, it's all well and good, but I'm not completely naive. And getting to the habit of doing the right thing, if you want, by being incentivized first, is, is sometimes is a necessary entry point. So if I take the, the six-point matrix or the, or the six steps of the, of the model, the, the reinforcement is the, first, is, is the last one, actually. It's about KPIs. But if you want to work on what people think and value, it's, it, it's more the, the non-financial incentive and right. the vision and the inspiration. I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the opportunities the crisis uh, has uh, has brought to us is the fact that clawbacks and models uh, are back in back into the spotlight. What do you think is the role that a board of directors should play in changing the risk culture? Absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. I mean, it's it's um, it's a platitude to say. I mean, it's so common to say that culture is turned from the top, but without. Um, without the role modeling of senior management, um, you have very little hope uh, because people will see it's okay to to, to misbehave, I mean, to misbehave or to not behave. If the boss is not doing it, why would we do it, really? And actually, I have a very good example to that. Um, I'm doing an in-company training with um, an, an American company, but it's a UK branch of a, a of an American company. And I started training their staff, and people were happy. It was on, on risk awareness generally and risk management generally. And then one day, after a number of sessions, um, the CEO decided to attend with his senior team. And I was very nervous because I thought, my God, how, I, how will a CEO will have the patience to sit through a training on risk management for two days? 
And then after the morning, uh, we started chatting, and he was happy and everything, so that was fine. But what he said was very interesting. He said, I'm a role model here. I cannot use my BlackBerry. I cannot do things, because otherwise it will send the wrong signal. And it was very interesting to see that this guy was completely aware of the influence he had on his people, let alone that he's liked and and everything, but he really disciplined himself to be there, to attend, not to check his emails during the session, to be involved and to participate because his attitude would be mimicked by his direct report that were there who will then be mimicked. So it's absolutely crucial. The attitude, so not only the say, I, um, I have in mind, and because I'm charitable today, I won't mention it, but people might guess, but I have in mind a private bank, um, an, in, an investment bank, oh, it's also a private bank, there you go, or oh, everybody knows who it is, um, who has a very, very poor risk culture. Everybody knows it, the market knows it, they're on the press all the time for poor, poor risk management. The top management of this bank is absolutely despicable in terms of attitude to risk management. Um, there's no support at all, there's no buying at all, it's all talk, talk, talk. Uh, they run into legal problems now uh, because, uh, because the shareholders are not very happy to be lied to. Um, so so you, have, you have the best and the worst examples in the financial sector to that amount. But it, absolutely crucial, yes. Indeed, thank you for being charitable and, and not <laughs> closing the name. And if we're still at the, um, at, at the C-suite, um, what would be the one question that you would ask a CEO of a financial institution in order to judge or to evaluate the risk culture? If he feels confident that the, his direct report, I, A, are in control, and B, are telling him the truth. Um, that probably would be one of the things. Or to put it differently, if, if, if I had to be in charge of the business, but actually I'm, I've, I've interviewed a number of CEOs, but one of the interviews I run, which I thought was particularly interesting, is the CEO was telling me, look, if something goes wrong in my business, I'm the one blowing up. And it's even worse in the U.S. with, I mean, the, the legal penalties are... are, are often more stricter in, Euro, in, in the U.S. than in Europe. So I want to make sure that I know our exposure, that if there's a threat on the business, if something can go wrong, I know it. And for me to know it, my direct reports know it. Um, and I need to run risk committees where information is shared and transparent. So that would be the question is, when you're in a risk committee, how confident are you that you get that you get clear information. Risk culture doesn't mean always take no risk. I mean, I talk to very, very prudent banks, uh, uh, but there's a question of, 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 of management priorities and business priorities. You can be, you know, we have a little risk aversion being risk taker, but as long as you know where you step into, that's fine. Of course, there can be profits without risk. And uh, there's always a fragile tension between uh, marketing and sales and, and risk management. Um, what would be the top two measures that you would use in order to ensure that their uh, incentives are aligned? Marketing and sales and risk management. Um, well, the risk-based risk -based performance. Um, would be the, the one. So the, the idea of RayRoc, for instance, is you can lend a credit, but you have target per uh, type of um, transaction. So at client level, you want a credit margin that cover your expected loss. No, oh, at transaction level, you want a credit margin that cover your expected loss. At portfolio level, you want a credit margin that covers your expected loss and also your, your capital for credit risk. So th these are the sorts of um, risk-based uh, performance. Uh, you can have, but also volumes versus profitability. A classic in insurance companies is that uh, for many years, insurance companies have incentivized by their sales force by volume, in banks also, mind you. And then they realized that the, the number one sold products were the, the product was a low margin, but because they were the ones easier to sell. 
So now they're incentivized, they're sales force by profitability of the product. So having any sort of risk-based performance adjustment is, is the right thing. You were talking about clawback. Well, clawback is, is more in the idea of um, reducing the short-termism of, um, of manager, which I, which I support. Um, but in, in, in market environment, for instance, in trading environment, you, you, you have uh, limits. You have all sorts of, uh, uh, all sorts of, of market limits. Now you have bonus for uh, uh, bonus for performance, but within within these risk limits, it's all about risk based performance, really. Right, right. And uh, to add to an example to what you mentioned before, I know of a comp of an insurance company that issued a a product where the incentive for selling the product was higher than than the actual first um, for, first first payment. Um, they ended up with a liability of about a million euros, and that, that happened in Romania. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it happens as well than in Romania because the the insurance companies have this funny way of, of taking all the expected value, adjusted expected mm -hmm. value. <laughs> so you have the lifetime benefit booked in day one, which is crazy. I think right. that, I don't know if any insurance are listening to us, but this is this. <laughs> Indeed. Maybe propinquity will, 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 would help, uh, as you mentioned before, trying to, to get the departments uh, closer. Oh, yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well. absolutely. And I can see that even in training, you know, um, when I have in company training and I have marketing people who are, you know, very reluctant at first. I had a marketing lady, a very senior, very clever woman, the other day, and I started training by saying, I asking everybody's objective, and she said, "Well, to be honest with you, I'm here because I have to be," and <laughs> clearly that set the tone. <laughs> and um, and after two days, she was a lot more positive because because you let them realize that, you know, it's not all even, uh, evil. And um, positioning the, the risk management as an enabler to the business is something that goes down really well. Right. Okay. How would you suggest dealing with those uh, in an entity who are the naysayers to change? Pardon me? The, How would you suggest dealing, dealing with an entity? Uh, no, with, with the people in an entity that are the naysayers to change. Do they have to leave or do they have to be persuaded into uh, if, transformation? Look, if they really don't want to change, um, I had two versions. I have the, the British version is, uh, the British say is fitting or say goodbye. <laughs> and the Australian say is the FIFO and FIFO is fitting or fuck off. So, this is the version <laughs> you want. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we so yeah, eventually no, but eventually you cannot have whether it's in motivation in risk management. I don't think you cannot afford reasonably in a business someone who will destroy the whole work that you're doing by con contaminating the motivation of others. Right, right. Well, the, good that the accountants would understand something differently on on FIFO. There. Yes, exactly. That's what's <laughs> interesting. Actually, it's not mine. I've been told. <laughs> yeah, uh, behavioral economics are becoming more and more important, and you've mentioned propinquity uh, earlier. Um, do you have some um, some other examples that that would be interesting for for changing risk cultures that relate to behavioral economics? Well, basic, basically, a, a lot of. Um, a lot of the elements that you see, and if you if you read the influencer, for instance, or if you if you read, um, oh, the name escaped me, me now. F Margaret Fernand. Uh, I'm afraid I can't help you on that one, but I know a good book on motivation. I'll, I'll come there. There's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, uh, uh, psychology. Um, oh, damn! It's going to bug me now. Um, the oh. Dog. There's a lot of psychology in risk management, more and more. And um, I think the, 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 the quantification, the, we have some progress to make in, in, in the quantitative part of operational risk, no doubt. I mean, there's still a lot of, um, a, a lot of methodological hurdles. But the, the aspects, the, the psychological aspects uh, in, in management and in risk management, in management it, it was documented. But it looks like we've forgotten it to some extent for risk management and we have to reinvent um, or, or, or to dig out, let's say, an, an, a number of um, of what was common knowledge, let's say, in the, the 70s maybe, 
on uh, on people's management for, for risk management. Yes. Right. We we've uh, anchored ourselves too much into the rational expectation. Uh, Willful and blindness. That was the one. Willful blindness. Margaret Esselman. That's one of my uh, favorite books, and I must have given to someone because I can't find it on my bookshelves now. But um, in in these elements, so Margaret Esselman is a CEO, and uh, the the subtitle of this book uh, was Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. So it's 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 very psychological, but it, it's also cover. Uh, uh, corporate examples like how the your environment contaminates who you are, and if you work in very um, negative environment or fraudulent environment, you become fraudulent as well, just because of contagion. She takes the example of Enron, and I'm charitable, so I'm not talking about another <laughs> organization I know who had the same the same contamination, even though it's. it's public information. So you, you have this notion, you have the, the notion of contamination. You also have the, the bystander approach or the bystander effect. You know, you, the, it's in free economics as well. You have this famous incident uh, of, a, of a robbery that take pla took place in, um, in a neighborhood uh, where there was a hundred witnesses um, out of the windows, basically neighbors. Uh, witnessed for 30 minutes a woman being robbed and only three called the police and that has been studied because how come that these 100 people normal you and I well intended don't call the police when they say they see someone being mugged it's because it's been demonstrated and because the more people observe an incident the less likely each of them is to act because everybody's counting on them on, on everybody else uh, so if, if if you count on the group to act, you won't, and that has repercussion in accountability as well and in control design. I, I, I talk to a lot of organizations, and, and many of them tell me, oh, you know, we have these four eyes principles and then six eyes principles, and everybody's accountable. When you hear speeches like everybody is accountable, the danger is no one is because everybody's relying on everybody else, and then you have the bystander. Um, approach. So that's that's a fascinating book as well. Um, that could be dealing yeah, on another a, occasion. That's an important aspect. Of, uh, and uh, as as Ben Ariely likes to say, we're predictably irrational to quote another book. Um, how would you differentiate, um, particularly at an executive compensation and bonus level, between those who are in a revenue-producing role and those who are not? So how do we differentiate between the risk management function, which does have some in, which does have indirect benefits and, and optimization for, for the corporation and, and, and the functions that are revenue generators. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you touched that on a, on a crucial point. Uh, and for too long in, in most organizations, the one people in sales or the one generating the revenues are the ones getting all the bonus and, and the bonuses in, in risk management, in cost function, in support functions are close to nothing or in audit are close to nothing. And that creates a, a terrible imbalance in terms of pay, in terms of recognition, in terms of reward as well, but also in, in terms of competence. Um, and, and, and I know the debate on pay. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship between how, how you pay people and how better they are, but still, there is a positive correlation. Uh, so uh, I would really advocate in favor of a much larger portion of the company benefits distributed to the support functions, to the back offices, to the risk management, to uh, every, every sort of... Uh, uh, HR, marketing, etc. in a sense that everybody generates a pool and sales alone cannot create all the revenues they create. So there is definitely an imbalance to fix there. Right, it's a strong analogy, but we need to keep the, the toilets clean uh, in order for an institution to function well. And I, I, I didn't mean to sound in a bad way. 
It's no, no, but I, actually, it's an interesting. Uh, it, it, it's an interest. I mean, it reminds me of a of a point because or an example uh, which I haven't thought about actually earlier on. Um, before before having heard the example, but we were, it was on a course. We were talking about business continuity issue, and one of the guys said, "Well, one day we had uh, we had a water cut in our building, and water cut meaning." No water, no toilet. Simply no toilet. No coffee, etc. But okay, that's anecdotal. But no toilet. Within two hours, everybody had to go home. So it is actually a real, a real business continuity issue. Right, right. No, it's very important. How do we make sure that it's not going to be all water under a bridge? There's a lot of discussion on risk culture right now. There, there's a lot of energy around um, around changing the org structure. Um, but how do we make sure that we're not going to to forget um, the episodes of uh, five years ago? I think if, if the organization, so if for, the organi for those who will do it well or do it lucky, let's say, <laughs> um, no, but for those who will do it in a way that, uh, that is significant enough so that they see the benefits of risk management, I don't see how they would go back really. Um, and I've been charitable in not mentioning the, the bad banks or the uh, confidential enough in not mentioning the good banks, but um, I was uh, this week in, in uh, uh, I was recently with a, with a bank who's very, very good in risk management, like I said, and uh, they've resisted, they went through the crisis really well. So it, they had a prudent version, they saw what it meant in terms of when the crisis hit, they were, you know, hit a little bit, but not not nearly as much as badly as their competitors. So they don't need to be convinced. So if by putting a lot of effort on risk culture, and I mean, we, we cannot be naive. We know that this the reason why operational risk and risk management is so high on the agenda is because we've been burned so bad, and also because the regulator has reinforced that very strongly by saying, you know, we're going to find you left, right, and center, um, the easy regulation that's it, over, etc. We saw this record fight for HSBC, etc., and HSBC is not the worst in class, my God, in terms of risk management. So all that is a very strong signaling that put the input it's like a little bit, you know, putting the ray rock initially in the sales force of credit. You put the impulse, you put the the mandatory aspect, and then by a process of learning, one by doing, you hope that the the institution will realize the benefit of being a bit more cautious, and the volatility they avoid, and the losses they avoid, and that will reinforce the process naturally. That's that a great would be point. my hope. Thank you very, very much, Ariane, for influencing our risk culture today. And I think we'll have a, a few very good takeaways from today's webinar. And if you'd like to learn more about operational risk from Ariane, we'll be announcing a three-day workshop um, in the coming months that's going to happen in the fall winter of uh, this year. And you can also hear more from Ariane on the Premier website, where she blogs periodically. Our next week's webinar is on the 22nd of May uh, with Anna Tadmati, professor at Stanford University and author of The Banker's New Clothes. Thank you very much for joining us today.